All right, thanks so much for your time, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Mast. I am a security engineer for CrowdStrike. And the title of this presentation is, as you probably already read, is uh, Boot Squad Stomping Out Your Cyber Squatters. Uh, today, I'm just going to talk about some uh, methods for domain possession, which exist out there to help uh, trademark holders. Let's go on to the next slide there, please. Thank you so much. We'll have an agenda today. We'll cover some specific terms, some definitions related to uh, the UDRP process. We'll talk about, um, we'll do an overview of what UDRP is. Um, we're going to dive into some protection mechanisms that you as a cyber squatter or a trademark holder can enable to protect yourself and those domains which you possess. Uh, we'll also talk about the DNS abuse policy and the URS. So we'll skip on into the definitions now. Thank you so much. I'm certain everybody's probably heard of all of these, but we're gonna walk through them for anybody who's unfamiliar. Um, at the top here, we have ICANN. That's the Internet Corporation for uh, Assigned Names and Numbers. This is a nonprofit organization, and they sort of um, coordinate the usage of DNS. Um, next, we have service providers. These are third parties who handle the UDRP complaints which are submitted. Uh, they are all accredited by ICANN. There is six of them currently, and they're spread around the globe. Being one of those service providers, WIPO, uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, they are the largest service provider. Um, they have many precedents and cases uh, under their belt, so they've, they've kind of gone through the rigmarole of settling all the crazy complaints that have come in under UDRP, and they uh, are the largest service provider. Uh, today, you'll also hear about complaints and respondents. A complainant is a trademark holder. They're an entity, an individual, an organization, somebody that holds a mark and then starts the complaint against a respondent. Uh, in this case, a respondent is somebody like a cyber squatter. They don't have to be one, uh, but for our uh, use case today, they're going to be one. Uh, they're the entity or individual in this case uh, who is squatting on the domain and the complaint is filed against. And then we also have cyber squatters. Those are the the individual you know who's out there registering those domains uh, they're putting traffic to those domains that are identical or confusingly similar uh, to those trademarks uh, which are registered to the complainant and we can move forward there and then just some definitions for you real quick you might hear these three different terms uh, the top level domain this is the highest level of domain in the hierarchical system of domains it's going to be on the right side of the dot for example, .com, .org, .net. Uh, you also have CCTLDs and GTLDs. CCTLDs are for country codes. It's a two-letter country code, and it's specifically associated um, with a particular country. And then things like GTLDs, they're generic, and they have our domains that are top-level domains for specific purposes. I'm certain everybody's seen uh, like a .com, a .biz, or if you work in security, you've seen the .zip. That's been pretty fun recently. So they all have specific purposes and they're out there uh, for you to register. And we can move forward. So we're gonna start with what is UDRP? Um, I'm certain if, uh, if you're out there managing a company you know, with like a large set of uh, trademarks, you've probably heard of this policy at least once. Uh, it's a policy created by ICANN. It's the Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution Policy. It was created in December 1999 by ICANN. Um, it was an alternative to reduce the overhead um, caused by litigation around trademark owners wanting to obtain domains which were registered um, you know, under false pretenses. Uh, so it's pretty speedy. It's gonna usually take around two months time frame, and we'll dive into some of the specifics there. And then the outcome of this is that your domain can only be canceled or transferred. Uh, there is no other outcomes. So again, um, it's meant to be a fast bypass for you know, long-term costly litigation related directly to domain disputes. It's pretty darn quick and being around two months uh, and you can get this domain canceled or transferred. Um, a fun fact here is the first case settled under this is for the WWF, the World Wrestling Foundation, and it was in uh, December 1st, 1999. It was the first case settled under UDRP. We can move forward. And again, that case was also settled by WIPO. So they, they not only have all the precedents, they also settled the first one. 
Um, so again, UDRP is a compliance structure. There's three portions of the compliance structure which need to evaluate to true for you to win your complaint uh, with the service provider and the registrar. Um, one is that the, the, the domain is identical or confusingly similar. Sorry to bring up my notes here real quick, my apologies. Um, so whichever domain is registered by the cyber squatter, um, it should be identical or confusingly similar to the existing trademark on hand. This is evaluated by a panelist, so a human will evaluate that. Um, and it should be something that you, the complainant, has rights to. Um, as well, you will need to prove that the uh, respondent has no rights or legitimate interest. So the second part which needs to evaluate to true is, one, you should provide evidence that you have rights to this. And two, you should also provide a case that makes that the respondent has no legitimate interests or rights, uh, and you should provide evidence to this. And then part three, uh, the domain name has been registered in bad faith, and that's where what we're going to talk about today is, from the research I've conducted, it seems that bad faith could be spoofed and then used to potentially win large trademark holders' um, domains that they, they wish to own. So we'll move forward and kind of dissect each part of this uh, complaint structure a little bit more in depth, but that's at the high level of the three portions which need to evaluate the true for you to obtain your domain via UDRP. All right, so how long does this take? I know as soon as you probably find uh, you know, a lookalike domain out there that's, that's fishing on behalf of your organization. How quickly can you get this done under UDRP? At a minimum, it's probably going to take around two months. You could shorten this process in the event if the respondent does not respond to your claims. You can cut out that response process, but we'll talk through each specific portion uh, of the process here real quickly. It's broken into about seven different sub-processes, uh, starting off with the filing. Uh, this filing is the filing of the case under UDRP. Um, as an example, there's no deadline. So there's no like statute of limitations here. Uh, an example here is Toyota recently filed a case that was uh, on a domain which was registered almost 18 years prior. This is just a, a typo graph, you know, uh, based domain, basically it was Toyota with an extra T. It took them 18 years to file this UDRP case, but they were successful in obtaining the domain once they could prove all three were true which we discussed earlier. Uh, there's a verification stage, which happens next. Your service provider will make sure um, that the domain is locked and that the privacy information is removed, not for everyone to view, but for the case, the respondent and the complainant, so that you can potentially make amendments if uh, the privacy information was, the HUA's information was not provided correctly. Uh, I know we've probably all seen this from time to time, uh, where HUA's information is either spoofed, incorrect, or just not provided at all. So that's what this verification stage is for. The domain is locked, so it can't be transferred. And the true, whatever who has information, the full set, full set of it will be provided here. Um, we'll move on to step three after those two days. There's a compliance check. Uh, there's a word count. Basically, the service provider will need to validate that the um, explanation meets the required word count, which I think is 5,000 uh, as well. It will need to, the, the service provider will validate that the complaint, um, you know, meets all of the, the, the filing items, basically, that all the boxes are checked. Uh, um, everything is complete in the compliance section. So they're going to go through, evaluate your complaint, make sure it's valid. If it is, it'll move into commencement. This commencement portion is where it's going to take around 20 days, can take less, uh, but basically they're going to take your complaint and file it with the register. Uh, wherever that domain is located. They're going to send it out and they're going to require a response uh, from the registrant for the respondent uh, within 20 days. Uh, in most cases, respondents uh, do not respond, so you can shorten this time frame, but uh, there is time in there for them to uh, review what has been sent to them, uh, especially if you have a high dollar domain or something that's you know very um, close to your brand. Uh, they will, you know, occasional response. They have 20 days in there to provide a response. And then this goes back to uh, an arbitration or a panel, which comes with a decision stage. So your service provider will assign basically for the, the basic fee. Uh, they will assign you one panelist. And this is a human who's going to review the, the complaint itself and the response. And they're going to say, 
uh, oh, okay, this is confusingly similar. They're going to evaluate the two domains depending on uh, what is submitted. They're also going to um, evaluate if all three conditions we spoke about earlier are true. And they're also going to see if there was a response submitted. If there's no response submitted, the decision will already automatically go through uh, with the transfer stage uh, in favor of the complainant. And that will take 10 days once that decision is uh, provided from the, uh, the panelist. Um, so if the panelist says, you know, we should transfer this or we should cancel this based off of what was requested in the complaint, 10 days after that panelist decides that, they have 10 days to actually enable that functionality uh, and push the domain uh, whichever direction was requested for the complaint. Um, and then as a note, an interesting item, uh, within the decision portion, normally with your uh, your basic UDRP complaint, you'll get one panelist who will review your decision. Um, in the event this is something that's very important to you, you can have your evidence reviewed by three panelists, um, which may you know have a better, uh, a more favorable decision based off of uh, potentially complicated evidence which could be submitted. So that's always an option to you. That adds a small fee, um, but you are capable of. Uh, requesting a larger panel size uh, during that stage. Uh, also, the respondent can request a larger panel in the event they feel that more evidence needs to be evaluated. All right, and we can move forward there. Thanks so much. Um, on the right, you'll find kind of like a high-level flow chart of how this process functions. Um, but basically, it's just broken down that that complaint comes in, it's validated to ensure that it's not BS, uh, and that the, the complainant has gone through and submitted all of the required functionalities. The response is filed, or in most cases, it is not filed. Uh, again, those registrants, they sometimes do not respond, uh, sometimes being almost 90% of the time. So it's favorable for you to do this UDRP process in the event that you want to get one of those domains back. A panel is approved and appointed, so they'll be assigned to your case. They'll review the evidence or evidence that is not submitted by the respondent. And then they'll give you that decision. And then there's 10 days for that to come back into your portfolio or be canceled. Um, again, each stage has a variable time frame. Um, extensions are available. Uh, some use cases where extensions are available is if you're submitting claims with multiple domains. Um, there's been UDRP complaints with 500 plus domains. So you could imagine evaluating the evidence in those cases would take months. Um, but again, most of them are very swift. It's, it's uh, denoted in the language under UDRP. Uh, the only actions which you can get out of this process, again, are transfers or cancellation. And at all times, it is always possible to settle. Uh, WIPO actually provides special protections here. Uh, I haven't looked into other service providers, but in the event you'd like to save money, uh, if a respondent would like to settle, uh, WIPO as long as the panel has not been appointed, will allow you to settle for a reduced fee. And we'll talk about some of the costs here uh, coming up. We can move on to the next one. Thank you so much. Um, so if you've ever gone about the process of purchasing uh, domains uh, on the open market, you know, something that's very desirable or has your corporate trademark or brand in it uh, may be very expensive. So the costs of UDRP, while they are um, expensive, I don't think that they are insane uh, compared to the prices of some uh, domains, especially, I don't know if you've been paying attention to things like the .ai domains, uh, you know, they're, they're tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, so what the UDRP start, fees start as, there's two main fees. There's a filing fee and then a legal fee. We'll talk about filing fees first. These are service provider specific. Today I'm going to talk about WIPO and I'll give you an approximation on the fee there. Uh, WIPO as a service provider charges around $1,500 US uh, for managing a single UDRP case. Um, as an interesting note, the fees have not changed since they were originally introduced in 1999. And you can choose one of the other six service providers, uh, but there's not really many, much variance. The policy is subject to all of them, and they only vary about 20% uh, total in costs. So if it were me, I would pick the WIPO 
uh, service provider as they have the most precedence under belt and they understand what they're doing in this case where some other uh, service providers, you know, they only have less than 20 cases uh, solved so far. It, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them. Uh, it's just if I wanted to validate, you know, where I was pushing uh, my complaint, I'd push it towards uh, the service provider uh, WIPO. Uh, as well, what, places where you can have expanded fees is multi-domains. With WIPO specifically, when your complaint expands past five domains, uh, you'll have a, an ex exponential fee increase. As well, we talked about earlier, if you'd like to have your case and evidence evaluated by a panel in the, in the decision portion, larger than one person, this panel uh, costs extra money. Uh, the complainant or the respondent can um, produce a requirement that this is uh, enabled. So, you know, think about that um, as an expected legal fee. If the respondent comes back, you may have to pay for a three-person panel. It's only about a $500 increase, uh, but it's something that you might have to, uh, you know, account for. And then we have legal fees. So. This is a formal complaint you want it to be done correctly. I'd suggest that it work with a, an attorney for this or your counsel. Um, most of the fees that are associated with legal fees are going to be flat fees. Uh, as there's no monetary gain or monetary response in UDRP filings, you don't get any money back. You just get the domain. Um, so again, uh, from what I have seen, most lawyers charge flat fees for the legal fee to file this complaint for you. Uh, so realistically, it's about $1,500 if you'd like to have a three-party panel that can add an extra $500. If you want to do multi-domain, you're going to pay based on the amount of domains over five. And then uh, there's going to be some legal fees to file that, uh, which are going to be a flat fee in most cases. And your attorney will discuss that with you. And we can move forward. All right, so to break down what really is... Um, the three tests or the three elements which need to evaluate to be true as part of the UDRP process. Um, we're evaluating the first control here. Uh, we're going to break into two sub subsections and we'll, we'll work through it. Uh, one is the domain must be uh, identically or confusingly similar uh, to your mark. Um, in the bottom right, you'll see one of those find the differences. Uh, basically, it's any of those items where something is confusingly similar. You can have variations, spelling errors, abbreviations, uh, substrings, modifications, homoglyphs, um, even using some of the uh, TLDs like SUCKS and other uh, uh, TLDs out there uh, related to that would evaluate with a, a mark in it. Um, those are all considered to be confusingly similar uh, to the mark itself. Uh, in the middle of the slide, you'll notice, though, that WIPO overview does not consider the TLD exception and does not consider the TLD except in special cases. Um, so, for example, if your trademark evaluated, if your trademark and the TLD read together to be the full trademark, um, in most cases, they would not consider that to be uh, valid under UDRP, except for in cases where it's uh, potentially derogatory, like if you use the TLD sucks or uh, other words that are out there uh, as TLDs. So you should not try to consider uh, submitting UDRP complaints uh, utilizing the TLD itself. We can go ahead and move forward. Part two of number one, we're going to talk about trade work requirements. Um, you yourself need to have rights to this complaint uh, rights to this mark in order to make this complaint. So you can't make this on behalf of um, somebody else's mark uh, unless you're, you know, a law firm or legally representing that, that mark holder. Um, you need to have rights to the mark of the service um, as well as dictated by some uh, UDRP cases in the past. All marks uh, internationally are accepted. Uh, so if the complainant is in China and the registrant is in the U.S., um, it's all valid. The only thing which is not valid is that there is state level trademarks in the United States um, as they, sorry, I'll pull up the actual wording for you. Because state regulations are issued with no examination, a state registration does not give rise to the same presumptions of validity and ownership as does a federal registration. Basically, we're saying here that 
Um, all marks, uh, WIPO has evaluated uh, as part of the WIPO overview that all trademark rights are valid except for U.S. state marks because they do not examine if uh, duplicated marks exist in other states. So they'll only respect U.S. federal registrations. Um, common law trademark is also accepted, but it must be heavily defended. Uh, you'll have to provide uh, extreme defense uh, in your complaint, uh, highlighting how you are locally known as that trademark. Um, it is not recommended that you use that, especially if, um, unless it's, you know, like a, a sort of uh, last, last defense there. Uh, but it is possible to defend a UDRP complaint uh, with proper evidence and uh, common law trademark. So if you have uh, both of those two functions, you've evaluated the first test is true, you, you own the mark, and uh, it is confusingly similar. We'll move on into um, uh, some examples of what these confusingly similar items look like. Uh, I'm sure everybody's probably dealt with this. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, we have a whole bunch of different types of techniques for creating lookalike domains, which are all valid uh, and could be submitted as DDRP complaints. I'm sure you've seen and dealt with these in your daily life. As well, we also have some examples of URL hijacking with spelling mistakes uh, or substitutions. These are all also valid in the event that they would meet all three conditions as presented here. Again, being confusingly similar, you have the mark, you own that uh, mark, and we'll work through the other two conditions. But these are just some examples. Uh, homographs are also, homoglyphs are also um, valid here. Uh, we can move on forward. Part two, you need to demonstrate that you have rights or legitimate interest, and you also need to prove that the re registrant or the respondent, my apologies, does not have any rights. Um, so success here requires demonstrating, um, you need to prove how you own this. So you should uh, provide potentially your US trademark numbers or wherever you are located. Um, as well, you should describe how uh, the respondent does not have any valid justification to this mark, uh, the branding, or whatever is being used um, in the domain. Uh, evidence will be collected uh, as part of your complaint uh, and submitted, so you should be able to work with your legal team or whoever is holding your trademarks and submit all of that information as part of your original complaint. You need to make this part as strong as possible because you, one, want to defend yourself, and two, prove that the uh, respondent does not have any rights to stand on. Um, and finally, with this part, burden of proof can be shifted. If you prove that you have rights to this and you can't prove that they don't have rights to this, um, as part of part two, uh, they can be requested to, they being the respondent, can be requested to provide how they have proof uh, of demonstration um, or rights to this. So. In the event that you are unable to collect further evidence, um, it, it can also fall back onto the uh, registrant here to provide, oh, uh, you, you registered this, the other party who says they own it uh, owns this domain from their you know, the information provided, how do you own it? So just think about that if you're a squatter, um, you may want to potentially document why you have purchased this lookalike domain um, and, and keep that in your portfolio. We can move forward on to part three. And what everybody is probably interested in is, is uh, the use of bad faith. And this is where uh, a lot of UDRP claims uh, really get um, the, the heat or the backing. Um, there's two types of bad faith. There is registration of bad faith, and then there's usage of bad faith. Um, the four types of uh, the highlighted methods are listed below. But basically, if that domain is registered, for the purpose of resale. <clears throat> um, maybe you monitor or you add, you're an administrator uh, for a, a corporation. Um, you know, these uh, cyber squatters may reach out and request a, a sale of a domain for a large swath of money, much more than what it originally cost to purchase from the registry. Uh, that's an example of bad faith there um, as well. Um, based off of the privacy information, um, an example of bad faith might be a pattern of conduct if you're a serial cyber squatter and you use the same information over and over again, um, under UDRP, uh, arbitration panels have found that people performing this with a pattern of conduct is considered a bad faith mechanism. 
uh, if you're out there disrupting a competitor, um, and what under UDRP is considered a competitor is any person who is opposition of another. So if you're out there and you're just trying to purposefully disrupt your competitor or anybody who you know would have that similar looking or confusing looking domain, uh, you can fall under bad faith. And then the last one is confusion. I'm sure that's been dealt with a lot in the cases of phishing. Um, you know, lookalike domains are powerful weapons for attackers to launch their phishing uh, domains and campaigns on, uh, phishing emails, things along those lines. So uh, if it's been used for any of those sort of, uh, if it's been used or could be used uh, in the likelihood of confusion, that can be considered a uh, an item under bad faith for establishing bad faith. Um, and again, all three of these need to be, all three of these conditions we talked about earlier, you have to have the mark. Uh, you must be able to demonstrate how you have rights to it uh, and the other party does not. And then you need to also establish bad faith. These all need to evaluate to true in order for the EDRP complaint to be successful. Uh, so that's why it takes so long to go through and also why you want to have a very strong complaint whenever you make it originally. So I wouldn't rush on your complaint because you need to compile all this evidence uh, in order to be successful. We can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you so much. And then just some interesting considerations here. We talked about domain privacy, but also GDR, GDPR exists. I know everybody probably has had to deal with that. Um, but basically, there's now privacy information and redacted information uh, in DNS and in WHOIS, uh, the database for who is registering these domains. Um, so whenever you're filing your initial complaint, you should take for face value what is whatever, whatever what is inside of the WHOIS information. Um, whatever name is displayed there, the contact information, your complaint should be filed with that information. As part of the verification process, you'll be provided um, the full WHOIS information of which then you should make an amendment with your legal team uh, to actually you know, update the claim against the full swath of information. Uh, and then also I'm stating here that amendments may bring strength to your complaint. Sometimes whenever the uh, who is information is fully revealed, you can identify from that information submitted that it is a serial cyber squatter. This can bring a lot of strength to your case because uh, again, that is a method under bad faith, which you might not have noticed before, but you could also amend your case to one, um, you know, bring that serial cyber squatter to light and to uh, highlight that their behavior as a method of bad faith. Uh, some examples I've seen here is a, a couple important cases were recently defended uh, where domains were falsely registered in President, former President Barack Obama's name. Um, and there's a, just a lot of interesting precedents from WIFO around um, filing uh, these cases with privacy and uh, enabled. So. Very interesting portion of this. We'll move forward. Thank you so much. Um, one thing that I had identified is that uh, the bad faith section uh, of the UDPR is something that you could potentially create yourself uh, if you were a malicious trademark owner and you really wanted to get something back. Evidence submitted uh, within UDRP complaints is human reviewed. And it doesn't appear from what I have researched to be technically validated or dug into extremely deep. Um, another thing I have noticed uh, evaluating a large portion of uh, squatters security controls is that they lack the mechanism, the security mechanisms that you would want to have on your domains uh, potentially to protect them. What am I saying about this is that I've seen a lot of squatting domains that lack SPF records. Uh, that are potentially in a domain registrar accounts, which do not have multi-factor authentication. And I've also seen uh, squatters, which use automated tools to purchase domains, and then they point them to incorrect name servers. Um, what does this lead to? This leads to, one, uh, the ability for you, a trademark holder, to spoof emails that are related to squatter resale emails, trademark abuse emails, and spam emails. Basically, you could make your own bad faith in the event you didn't have that. And it could be evaluated that, you know, it could help your case. I'm not saying to do that. I'm just saying that it's something that appears that you could go, you could generate the bad faith uh, and then have a very successful case uh, based off of a squatter purchasing a domain and then, you know, insecurely uh, not securing it correctly. Uh, as well, I've seen compromised domain accounts at registrars. 
uh, where the uh, squatter will hoard that domain, sit on it, and it will get taken over uh, when there's like a, a large dump of account credentials, and then it'll be used for something malicious. Uh, meanwhile, the squatter didn't actually mean to do that. And then we also see that uh, with the incorrect name servers, sometimes uh, squatters will go ahead and they'll, they'll automatically point websites to name servers which are not hosting that website, uh, in which another squatter will move in and start using that. So the last two were kind of cases where a squatter purchased the domain, but they've lost control of it. Um, this also opens it up for you to identify if these things are going on and uh, sort of make your own bad faith. Um, again, squatters will sometimes forget their SPF records and you can potentially send um, you know, threatening emails like, hey, let's sell this uh, domain for $80,000 or some high arbitrary amount. Um, you could use trademark marks, images, logos, and emails related to the lookalike domain, um, or you could start sending spam with phishing links, um, which are all covered under bad faith by an unprotected domain, similar to your uh, trademark. We can move forward. And then just some examples of spoofs. Um, they're pretty common ones. So in the upper left-hand corner, we actually have an item, an email, which is from uh, a domain that's not related to LinkedIn, but it's just being sent from, I think it's uh, coeng.com. And that's actually uh, an excellent domain, which is good for uh, domain abuse procedure, not for UDRP, but uh, just an example I wanted to show. And then another one is paypal.com there, you see, with the one added into it. This is an excellent domain for uh, being obtained under UDRP. PayPal doesn't own that, I bet you they do now. Um, we can move forward, so I just wanted to give you an idea of what this looks like. Um, another consideration an item I had seen uh, is very spoofed who is information. I gave an example earlier where uh, President Bar former President Barack Obama's information was used to register domains. Um, this can be negative for you if you're a registrant in a case and you actually want to hold that domain. Um, but another interesting part here is uh, using a respondent's or a complainant's true who is information to register a domain. What I'm saying is, is uh, and the case I'm setting is Barclays Bank versus Barclays Bank. Uh, a similar lookalike domain was registered with identical who is information. Um, this sets off some alarms where you're asking yourself, uh, do we have a, a tech debt issue where you know, somebody in, in Barclays was registering this domain and just didn't know how to and went and did it themselves. Uh, is this an attacker that wants to hide uh, inside of my who is information and, you know, like uh, they're using the identical information and trying to uh, own this for as long as possible, potentially use it for a phishing campaign. So one thing to look out for and monitor is um, who is information that's identical to your own. And this is where I would state that, you know, control of, uh, Having a, a true portfolio of your domains and monitoring those is very important. Also, if you operate any sort of security reputation tools, um, there's a couple out there that uh, you know can kind of give you a, a grade for your, all of your domains or your portfolios or your external um, presence. Utilizing uh, identical who is information it may have this show on your security reputation tool. So. Uh, in the event an attacker registers a domain similar to yours and utilizes identical who is information, uh, it may temporarily lower your score, um, especially if they do this in mass. Uh, just something to look out for and to think about um, as well. It might throw you in a loop for, did my team register this and not tell me about it? Uh, or is this uh, you know, a malicious attacker? So just uh, who is information is always interesting to look at, um, especially in the case the real Barclays Bank won their domain back from Barclays Bank. Uh, we can move forward. Uh, here I'm just giving you some mark holder protections. Uh, you're an existing trademark holder and you want to um, you know, secure your domains as best as possible. What can you do to ensure that that's um, you know, easy to do? This is just a small checklist, it's not a total list. But it, you could run through utilizing a credible domain registrar. And what do I mean by credible? Uh, you should review their information security policies and their, you know, their how much risk they're taking on and how they secure themselves. 
uh, before you go ahead and work with them as well, you should utilize and enable domain locking and non-push based multi-factor authentication for your registrar. I'd request that you enable FTF records to either deny mail from domains you don't send mail on uh, or specifically point out uh, where mail should come from so that spoofing uh, bad faith is not possible. You should make your registrar aware of your trademarks. Uh, by working with your registrar uh, and uh, sort of importing your trademarks, you can have them help you purchase new GTLDs when they come out. For example, when .zip dropped, uh, you could you know, have those in your portfolio ahead of time and be the squatters out there. It sort of makes your life easier uh, if you work with your registrar. Um, also, I would recommend utilizing a domain monitoring registration tool. Um, this tool will just monitor the list from all the registrars uh, and it will update you to any sort of squatter activity related to your marks uh, or abbreviations of your marks. You, know, you can do a lot of things with these sort of tools uh, to help reduce how effective squatters can be, as well as uh, you know malicious squatters. And then um, I would also recommend that you should build in socialize a policy for managing your portfolio. Uh, people at your organization are going to want to purchase domains potentially related to you know if you're growing, they're going to want to purchase these domains. So you should have a process and procedure out there for managing your portfolio, knowing what's inside of it, um, and being able to expand it. When, it, when it's required, it shouldn't be some sort of um, like hidden process. It should be uh, well socialized. Um, and again, yeah, those domain, domain monitoring tools are excellent for um, not only monitoring new registrations, if there's something that you can't obtain through UDRP, uh, domain abuse, or the URS, they can also monitor those domains in the event that they are dropped or locked or transferred. Um, so it's just a really nice visibility item and it helps reduce overhead of having to, uh, you know, manually uh, watch those sort of domain registrations. We can move forward. Uh, if you are a squatter and you're watching this talk and you want to better protect yourself, I would say that you should also utilize a uh, domain locking and uh, multi-factor authentication that is not push-based. Um, I state this uh, just because I've seen uh, squatter accounts taken over and used maliciously by other third parties. Um, I would also submit correct who is information as that's just an easy in for um, bad faith evidence. Uh, and I would also utilize privacy services in conjunction to that who is information. Just protect your identity. Um, under the WIPO overview, it would be important to document a business case of why you need this lookalike domain and um, explain ha or have on deck uh, you know, evidence as to this domain's purpose. If you really want to keep it in its portfolio and potentially um, you know, uh, sell it at a later date or be, have it be purchased by the trademark holder, uh, you're going to want to back it up as to why you need this. Uh, and the best way I've seen to do that is through having um, credible business evidence um, as to why you need this uh, domain. It doesn't have to be real, it just has to be a plan um, at a minimum. Um, I would also enable SPF records um, for your domain and DNS so that you can protect against um, malicious mail and document where mail should come from. Uh, that way in the event any sort of spam mail or uh, spoof mail is tried to be sent on that domain, uh, you can protect against that. And then also I would avoid registrant information where precedents can be identified. And what I mean by this is that if you are a serial squatter, you should not use your information again. Um, you should potentially break out chunks of domains that you're squatting on uh, and use unique information for each one so that they cannot establish, they being the complaint, a precedent based off of your uh, actions uh, in domain registrations and squattings. So maybe like a new identity for each time you uh, do this or chunk it by organization or uh, area. Um, there's also some other protections we'll talk about, uh, like the domain abuse in the next slide. In the event the UDRP is not successful for you, or you have a, you're not able to demonstrate all three of the uh, characters um, that were highlighted uh, earlier. You know, you can't evaluate all three to true. There is uh, the DNS abuse framework, 
This is adopted by 48 uh, registrars and registries currently. It was developed in October 2019 uh, by the .org Foundation. And um, it covers these five top areas here, malware, botnets, phishing, farming, and spam. And the, basically the last action that this abuse framework takes is uh, killing that DNS registry or that domain registry. Um, so it works through um, the chart at the bottom there. Uh, as part of this abuse framework, if any of these conditions are met, uh, you should, you should uh, reach out to the site operator, the registrant, the hosting provider, and work your way from left to right on that list. Um, in the event that uh, these conditions are met, uh, you can get the registry to pull the domain itself. Um, but it's just, uh, it would take a long period of time. Statistics are published, and I can give you some information on this. But um, I would definitely suggest um, utilizing UDRP or URS first. Uh, but again, if the domain is uh, hosting malware, hosting botnets, phishing um, is utilized for opioid farming. Uh, or spam, then this is a good process for you to potentially investigate and maybe even get the site or other services taken down. And then the last thing to consider is URS, and that's on the next slide. So URS is also offered by ICANN. Uh, this is uniform rapid suspension. This is very fast, uh, usually less than a month. Um, but remember, uh, this shouldn't be used um, by large trademark holders who'd like to add the domains to their portfolio. This is very limited in scope, but it is very fast. So this only allows suspensions of domains. So this is going to push out. You're going to need to place a back order uh, with your registrar for the domain in the future. Um, this requires a very high burden of proof. The complaint can only be 500 words. So you must be able to demonstrate similar things as to UDRP, uh, but in a very short complaint. Uh, the fees are very reduced as compared to the $1,500 fee. This is only $300, uh, depending on the registrar or the service provider you work with. And this is this is fast. Decisions need to come back in three days. Uh, again, uh, it's usually under a month from start to finish, uh, but this can only be used for suspensions. Um, you'll still need to handle on your own how to obtain that domain after it is suspended, placing that status. Um, because of this, it's not recommended that you use this method. Uh, but it is out there for you to use in the event that you either have you know, a reduced legal budget um, or you need something taken care of right now and you can handle the rest on the back end with your registrar uh, or a third party. But I uh, just wanted to make sure that everyone knew about uh, URS. And then we'll just conclude. It's, uh, UDRP is just a potent resource. You know, If you're a trademark holder, um, you have the tripart framework here, um, and there's certain stages within the process that could be spoofed. So I wanted to just bring this to everyone's attention. Um, I think it's very powerful, um, but also the fact that it's human evaluated uh, leads to its potential abuse. Um, as well, we have uh, UDRP. As well as UDRP, we have uh, anti-abuse and the uh, URS policies, uh, which can also help you prevent cyber squatters. Um, if there's any questions, uh, that's going to wrap it up, but basically I just wanted to let you know as a trademark holder, you have uh, some excellent mechanisms for obtaining those domains without having to go to court, uh, and they vary in speed, time, and cost. Thanks so well, thank much. you, Joe, for an excellent presentation. Thank you.